for ECE 442-542. For the last time I will be speaking to you, the next time we meet, you will be ready to go on the final exam, which is in our normal classroom, Stewart Observatory, room N210. And that's in the middle of the afternoon, or the first of the afternoon, 1 o'clock to 3 p.m. on Thursday. The final will be comprehensive. And the 15 questions will be uniformly distributed across the semester. And you will need to know some of that material from homework eight. If you didn't do it, you might want to look at the solutions and make sure you understand what's going on with state space design techniques. Feedback of a full state feedback matrix and why you might need to put a gain on the reference input to adjust the DC gain. I think we've been over this enough times. The only new piece of information here is that you now have four pages of notes that you can use front and back. But everything else should be consistent with what we've talked about in previous exams. Let's now walk through some of this relative to the topics that you can expect on the final. And the first sort of concept is modeling. How do we do this modeling? And you should be able to play with the system in many different, whoops, not differential. I guess this is the, I'm not feeling comfortable about my tablet right now. Maybe it's tired. Maybe it knows it's the end of the semester. But this is now supposed to be You should be comfortable with the system appearing in many different representations. Difference equations, taking that to an all delay block diagram representation. You should be able to do that manipulation. Or if you now have difference equations in terms of inputs and outputs, you can assume you have access to the input, current input, current output, and put together the block diagram to build that up, an all delay block diagram. You should also be able to go the other way if you want to. You wouldn't have to go directly, but in the all delay block diagram, you could find a transfer function between the input and the output. And from the transfer function, you now are down here. In another model. And you could then. Inverse Z transform though that transfer function cross multiply and inverse Z transform to obtain the difference equation. You also should be able to go from the difference equation to a transfer function by Z transforming those that difference equation in terms of input output variables. And from the frequency domain at the bottom in the transfer function, you should be able to find a state space representation. And you wouldn't have to necessarily go immediately in that direction, but you could go to the difference equations, then an all block diagram, and then into a state space representation. From a state space representation, you should be able to go back to the all delay block diagram. It's basically sitting there for you in the state space representation. But if you have the all delay block diagram, do you remember how we obtain a state space representation? What's sort of the key step? If you now have this block diagram, maybe it contains three different delay blocks, how would you find a state space representation? Yes, all of the 
the, the answer to that was provided. I'll just repeat it since you probably didn't pick it up on the microphone. But here you are labeling the outputs of each of these delay blocks as your state variable components or the states. And there you might say the state variable components. I'm abbreviating it to state, but X sub 1, X sub 2, the states are outputs of your delay blocks. And if you have a state space representation, maybe that's where you're starting, you should be pretty comfortable just going back to a transfer function with this capital G of Z equaling H parentheses ZI minus phi inverse gamma relationship to obtain the transfer function. You need to be comfortable playing with or starting with any of those representations, models of your system, moving amongst them or doing any kind of analysis or design based on that particular starting location. If you're given a difference equation and asked to determine stability, for example, of that system, you might want to find the transfer function and look at the poles of the denominator, or the roots of the denominator, which are the poles of the system, to assess stability. And if it's discrete time, what are we focused on with stability? Yes, inside the unit circle, we're in the Z plane now, and now we're interested in what's happening or are all of our poles of our system inside the unit circle. You need to also be comfortable taking this the next step. This is now the model. Now if you excite that model or drive that system with some input, can you determine the output response? Or given any of these models, and some forcing term or an input waveform, I want you to be able to compute the Z transform of the output, Y of Z, or or maybe even and, the time domain output response, little y of L. And you might find that y of L a couple of, or sort of two levels of finding the output response. I may just ask you for the structure of that response. Do you remember what I'm meaning by that? Now you're looking at, do I have real poles in my denominator expression for capital Y of Z? Do I have complex conjugate poles in that denominator expression? And that now in informs what the structure of your response looks like. And I may not ask you to find all of the different coefficients, but you should be able to tell me the way that that response might be moving as a function of the time index L. Or, I might say, go ahead and find the complete solution. Either of those are valid questions that could be presented to you on the final exam. These strategies or techniques are really sort of assuming that you're very comfortable with 
the two domains, the frequency domain or the time domain. And we spent a little bit of time dealing with signals and systems in both of those domains. How are those, or do you remember maybe one of the key ideas that relates those two domains besides the Z transform operation? What's another piece of information? If I give you a Z transform expression and I say, give me the time domain version of that. Do you have enough information if I just give you the transform? What additional piece of information is needed? Pardon? Yes, the ROC, the rock, the region of convergence. You need to know where this transform is defined in what region of the complex Z plane. Again, here you might simply just be asked to find the structure of the response. Maybe you don't have to evaluate all the coefficients, but if you're given the region of convergence, now you can tell me, oh, is that a right-sided sequence? Is it a left-sided sequence? Is it a two-sided sequence, etc.? All based on what region in the complex Z-plane this Z-transform is defined. And there's really only three different patterns for that region of convergence. You have the unbounded region of convergence. I'm sorry, you can't see my arms showing you the unbounded, so you'll just have to pay the price for not showing up to the review session. One or two of your classmates did show up. Joke, but not too many more than that showed up. But there you have Z going off to infinity in the region of convergence. You might have a bounded region of convergence, or you might have a annular region of convergence, or a donut shaped, or a bagel, depending on what you're hungry for. But you now have this annular, and what's the annular region of convergence associated with in terms of index range? or the sides, sidedness of your time indices. That's two-sided. You now have poles. The poles bound your regions, don't they? The poles of your transform bound whether you, they're all, you never have poles in your region of convergence. And if you have an annular region, then you have some poles that are laying outside of that and some that are inside of that not on top of the, I don't know how best to describe that when I start talking about inside and outside, but if we had an annular region, now you have some pole or poles that are, here's the region of convergence for an annular, and those two edges of your annular region, each of those radii are bounded by poles in your transform expression. And if you didn't have those two poles on the outside, you might actually have an unbounded region of convergence that goes off to infinity. Or if you didn't have that interior pole, now you might have a bounded region of convergence. How does that relate to stability, this region of convergence? Is that question making sense? 
Do you understand the question that I'm trying to ask? If I give you this donut, is your system stable or unstable? You don't know, do you? You don't have enough information. You have to know where is the unit circle relative to that donut. If the unit circle is in lying in the region of convergence, then what do you know? Then it is stable, isn't it? If the unit circle is there, then you're stable. And you can have similar pictures with an unbounded region of convergence. Unbounded region of convergence doesn't say anything about the stability. Is that clear? That just means the region of convergence is unbounded. It goes off to infinity, but you have to know where's my unit circle relative to that region of convergence. The region of, or the unit circle might lie interior to some poles that are bounding the region of convergence and your signal or the inverse transform might not be bounded. Question? So the question is, how do we relate this, or I'm paraphrasing, how do we relate the S domain to the Z domain in terms of region of convergence? How come we never talked about that maybe in our introductory Laplace transform material? And one of the reasons is a lot of times we were dealing with one-sided S or Laplace transformed expressions. We were assuming a time, let's say, t equals zero and going positive. Then we had the inverse known. If somebody gave us an h of s, we would know that the inverse Laplace of that had to be for positive values of time. But you can sort of think of this region of convergence in the s domain, but we really avoided that by saying, let's just deal with a one-sided inverse Laplace transform. But our region of convergence would typically be, let's say, well, if you wanted to think of it, it's more of a vertical line that's now, how do I want to describe this, sort of a half moon in the, let's say, in the right half plane of the S plane. You're now going off to infinity. It's not these nice geometric shapes. It's, it's a nice shape, but it's different. And so now if your region of convergence contained the imaginary axis, essentially, now you know that everything is in the left to the left of the imaginary axis and it's stable. Uh, it's kind of a... That will only represent half of the final exam problems, is this relationship between S domain and Z domain. But that's really what you want to be thinking about now after this class is how do I start making all of this, these connections with what I already know and what I've recently learned to add to. Now I think it's easier to talk about region of convergence in the Z domain and then go back and say, oh, let me dive deeper into what I did before I talked about Z domain or the Z transform. Now let me investigate the Laplace at a deeper level. I sort of like that sequence of events. You sort of avoid it initially in the S domain and the continuous time, and then you pick it up when we're talking about discrete because you're more mature and now you can go back and it makes maybe a little bit more sense to speak of that in the Laplace. That won't be on the final.
But did that help answer your question? Other questions on time domain, frequency domain. We are electrical engineers, and I think we take a lot of pride in being able to play in both domains and go back and forth. That's one of our identifying qualities. <laughs> then we started talking about discrete equivalence. I'm sort of taking a leisurely stroll through the material that we've talked about this semester. And I'm hoping that between now and the final on Thursday that you start to see this in a more connected manner. With discrete equivalence, we, we really broke those up into two different ways of finding discrete equivalence. Let me say that one of those techniques is when we used hold devices to precede our system in the time in the continuous time setting. So I'll call these hold equivalents. Here we might have then an input U some hold device, and then typically this is our plant. We might label that as a system, but it's usually some physical device, meaning you might have it modeled as a transfer function G of S, or you might have it modeled as a state space representation. And that now produces some output Y. Now to do this zero order hold equivalent, one of the first things that you have to identify or define as the sample period. How fast are we going to sample this system? And if we call that sample period T, that sample period, depending on what you're wanting to do with this system, but typically you're trying to control it, you probably want to be thinking ahead and select T based on the closed loop dynamics that you know you want to achieve in the closed loop, which are probably faster than the open loop dynamics of G of S or the eigenvalues of A. Those are the poles or the dynamic behavior of your system. The sample period T is based on closed loop dynamics. Once we've picked or determined what the sample period is, then we incorporate the hold, and typically our hold, or it will always be in this class, it's a zero order hold. That just means we are holding the input constant between samples. It's not trying to do anything fancy, it's a zero order hold, then we have what we call the zero order hold equivalent of this system G of S or in the time domain. If we are dealing with the transfer function based zero order hold equivalent, then we have our G of Z being 1 minus z to the minus 1, and that's coming to us because of the hold behavior, z transform of not just g of s, but g of s over s, where that s in the denominator is coming from this constant, this 1 over s, and associated with our zero-order hold manipulation. Don't forget that S in the denominator. Then you can look at your tables, which you better bring, 
to try to find, oh, if I have a g of s over s, or now I've introduced another pole at the origin in my Laplace transformed expression, now how do I find the z transform of that quantity? You could also, if you started with a, b, and h, you could find the state, the system matrix in discrete time from your system matrix in continuous time. Phi is now just e to the a t. It's a matrix exponential. You don't raise every element in your A matrix, or you don't take it to the exponential power. You now have to find this matrix exponential, which a lot of times if you're doing it by hand is this Laplace transform notion. And the gamma, the input matrix in your state space representation for discrete time is the integral from zero to cap T, E to the A mu, D mu times B. That's one set of discrete equivalents. That's when you have a plant or a system and it's preceded by a hold device. We also have the second category of discrete equivalents, which I'm just going to say are these non-hold <laughs> equivalents for a lack of better term. And now we simply have a transfer function, C of S, which might correspond to a controller or it may be a filter, but now we're not worried about preceding that with a hold device. If it is a controller, this might be our air signal and this might actually be the output of that controller, which is the input to our plant, which we typically call U. Here we have notice that there's no hold device preceding the system. In these non hold equivalents, we identified several different strategies for finding C of Z from C of S. Here we're wanting to go now from C of S into C of Z. We had one approach or one class of approaches, which were numerical integration techniques. The other class was created from doing a mapping from the S domain to the Z domain or this pole zero mapping approach. In the numerical integration, we had three that we looked at. We looked at the forward numerical integration approach. And that really meant that we were replacing s, the s variable, with z minus 1 over t. We also had the backward approach. If we're starting then with capital C of s, we simply replace s everywhere with a different expression in z. It's now the same numerator, z minus 1 factor, but now it's t divided by z. That was the backward approach. And then the bilinear or the Tustin was really sort of an average of the forward and the backward. This is this trapezoidal. You could now look at s. The numerator is the same, but now you are, and that looks the same. It's just that you are now looking at 
that's one way of writing it. You probably don't see it written that way. You probably see it as 2 over capital T times this ratio of z minus 1 over z plus 1, but this in a way connects it with the forward and the backward maybe a little bit differently. Those are the numerical integration techniques that we talked about. The pole zero mapping are all based on this relationship between s and z. z is equal to e to the st. That's now a, an advance of capital T units of time. z to the minus 1 is e to the minus st. That's a delay of one sample period. But with this, you have to sort of keep track of what was one of the things you needed to keep track of when you're when we were doing pole zero mapping? Do you remember? The pole zero excess. What if we had a pole zero excess of one, what was another way of describing or labeling that characteristic of our system? If our system had a pole zero excess of 1, what else could we say about that system that would give you the same information? It's related to poles and zeros. Well, so is the pole zero excess. You have a pole zero excess of 1, but now that pole zero excess is dealing with finite poles and finite zeros. If you have a pole zero excess of one, you now have an infinite zero, one infinite zero. If you had a pole zero excess of two, you would have two zeros at infinity. That's what I was trying to get you to think about or remind yourself of when you're dealing with pole zero mapping. You may want to worry about, or you do want to worry about, infinite zeros. I'm going to put usually in quotes because you don't necessarily map all of them. It depends on your particular situation and how you want to handle that, but you're usually mapping those infinite zeros. by applying what kind of factor? I'm assuming you all have your hands up. I just couldn't see because I didn't have my glasses on. So you're trying to map those infinite zeros in the z-plane to this location z equals minus 1. And that corresponds to a factor of z plus 1 in the numerator. And if you wanted to preserve some delays between the input of your filter and the output of the filter, you may not want to map all of those infinite zeros to zeros at z equal to minus 1. I might say only or make your infinite zeros one less than the number of infinite zeros you actually have. If you had two infinite zeros or two zeros at infinity, then you would just be looking at inserting one of these z plus one factors in your discrete equivalent transfer function. What else did you have to worry about in pole zero mapping? You remember? The zeros, the finite zeros, that, that's easy. You just use that z equal e to the st. The finite poles, that's easy. You just use that relationship. z is equal to e to the st. The infinite zeros, that's pretty easy also. You just add in these or introduce these factors, z plus 1. I shouldn't say add. You're just placing those in the numerator. 
in a product form with your other zero factors? What have I not mentioned in a transfer function? I mentioned poles and zeros. Typically you have a gain, don't you? And with pole zero mapping, you want to match the gain in capital C of Z with the gain of capital C of S. And where do you map, match the gain? Or There you can say it depends. It depends on whether this, what the filtering or the function is, capital C of Z or capital C of S, that you are playing with. Sometimes it may not make much difference whether you're matching DC gain or gain at infinity, but it's nice to know what you're doing. Questions on discrete equivalence. It's interesting how you become conditioned. I guess I'm just like the dog, Pavlov's dog, but now I'm looking in the right-hand corner and looking at the time and thinking I'm about out of time, but I'm not quite. I didn't start at the normal time. Typically, we were starting at 5.30, and so we would be well into the lecture at this point. We're not quite that far yet. We still have three more hours. No, you don't have to leave. Don't, don't. Sorry. Desired regions in the Z plane. That was another topic that we talked about. And here, I've been joking this semester, but I think you already, or I'm hoping that when somebody talks about percent overshoot, what are you thinking? your heart. And the heart are these logarithmic spirals that are determined by these damping ratios, zeta. What about if I give you a settling time specification? So the first one was a percent overshoot specification. You should know the formula or the plot that you can immediately identify the zeta, the damping ratio, given a percent overshoot. If I give you a settling time specification, what shape are you thinking about now? Or shapes, depending on the different values for the settling time. Now you're thinking concentric circles, or the radius r, and I might just, instead of writing concentric circles, I'm just going to say it's a target or a bullseye pattern, depending on the radius of those circles. A smaller circle corresponds to a longer or shorter settling time. You have a small circle inside the unit circle. Does that mean, and let's say you had another circle beyond that, but it was still inside the unit circle, which of those would have a shorter settling time or a faster responding system? The one with the smaller radius. R being small makes your response collapse more quickly. These kinds of ideas, you need to just be able to wake up and go target. Somebody will go, are you shopping? No, I'm settling. Sorry. I think we are about finished, aren't we? Peak time. Now what do you think of? angle. 
if somebody gives you a peak time, then you might be thinking about this relationship or the peak time, time to peak is pi over omega sub d. That's what we derived in an earlier class, but we learned or we used in this class. Now, what do we know about omega sub d? Or how is that related to something? Wait, we wrote down angle. How is omega sub d related to our angle? at the right relationship. Now we can replace omega sub d with theta sub d over t, or this now becomes pi t over theta sub d. And if somebody gives you a time to peak, maybe in a certain number of sample periods, you put that on the left, you set that equal to pi t over theta sub d, the only unknown is theta sub d, you now know the angle that you need your, and when we talk about these three relationships, percent overshoot, settling time, and time to peak, what am I assuming? Second order system. And these are just very crude because it's just a second. It's based on a second order. And if you have something other than a second order, which you probably will, you have to kind of realize that and just use these with a little bit of understanding that these aren't hard and fast. Well, my zeta was 0.6. Why didn't I get... What would you expect to have if zeta was 0.6 and it was a second order system? Do you remember? 10% overshoot. If zeta was 0.7, that's this really nice value. If you just see a heart that's a zeta of 0.7, you just it just makes you feel good. That's a 5% overshoot. But again, this is all based on a pure second-order system. And you can go the other direction. Now I'm playing with fire, but let's see how this works. If you wanted to go the other direction, oh, sorry, you may not have that capability on your paper. But I can use it. Now you can maybe see these different lines. You have these angles and you have your zeta lines, but maybe somebody gives you a pole, and they say, oh, this pole is located in the complex z-plane at 0.6. So now you go to 0.6, and maybe they say it's 0.6 plus and minus j.5. So now there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you say, oh, the pole is right there. Now that you've found that in rectangle, or you were given that maybe in rectangular form, maybe you found the transfer function and you identified the two dominant poles and they were at 0.6 plus and minus j.5, now you can start to go the other direction. You can now say, oh, I know if this is a second order system that's dominating my behavior, can you say anything about the percent overshoot from that star? You remember how the percent overshoot is related? It's not related directly to the rectangular coordinates. It's related to zeta. 
and zeta is now superimposed on that figure. And you can get this from Z grid in your MATLAB if you wanted to. And now we can see that my zeta value is between 0.3 and 0.4, but it's maybe closer to 0.4, but you know that now your percent overshoot is going to be 100 times e to the minus zeta pi over the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. And zeta you could just interpolate from where it's located. Maybe it's 0.38. And you plug in that zeta value and that gives you a rough feel for the percent overshoot of this dominant second order system behavior. What about another time domain parameter? Time to peak, can you obtain that from that star? Oh, I shouldn't have even asked that question. It's dinner time. If you now, and I'm sorry, I was talking to my mom yesterday and she was talking about strawberry rhubarb pie. And now I'm thinking about that with this. <clears throat> mom. Anyway, how many slices do we have? We've now maybe cut this upper pie into 10 wedges and we are beyond the second wedge, which is if each wedge is pi over 10, we're now 2 pi over 10, or a little bit beyond 36 degrees, because because each, we've cut 180 degrees into 10, each of those are, are angles are 18 degrees, we're now a little beyond 36 degrees, and that's now our theta sub d, and we have a relationship <coughs> of theta sub d for time to peak. Time to peak was this pi over omega sub d, but omega sub d times t was theta sub d, which allows us then to write this in that form. And now if we know theta sub d, which if we express it in terms of radians, it's a little bit bigger than 2 times pi over 10, whatever that number is, but 2 times 3.14 divided by 10, so 2 times 0.314. Do you guys all have pi memorized to 100 digits? That's actually what my mom and I were talking about on the phone yesterday. No. If we're talking pies, it's food, okay, with my mom, but now I'm in a different environment. Two times that, so it's now 0.618, or 628, I'm sorry, 0.628 radians. You divide that in and find your time to peak. That's two of the three time domain parameters. What else could we find? Do you know how far that is away from the origin or where it is relative to the unit circle? Is that star representative of a stable system? Yes, it's inside the unit circle. You could measure that. That's maybe why you have a ruler for the final exam. Now you know what R is, and once you know R, you know this relationship, and you could solve for the number of samples it's going to take you to settle from the radius. Questions on second order behavior and pole locations, how to go back and forth. Again, that is depending on, in the real world, you may be confronted with 
something like that, you might have a fifth order system. This is now the z-plane. And let's assume they are all inside the unit circle. What poles dominate in that constellation of poles? The ones furthest from the origin, and in this class we've agreed we'll just concentrate on that. If now somebody says, what are these time domain properties of a, sec of a system, and you have this fifth order system, you would say, I'm going to base my time domain behavior on these dominating poles, and the dominating poles are now those. those you could now put on that Z grid that we just talked about and infer the percent overshoot, settling time, and peak time from those locations and simply assume that those others are infinitely fast relative to those dominating poles. The next walk through the semester took us into controller designs and we started maybe not with what you will ever want to use but it gave us a way to develop some insight and intuition into what we need to happen when we're designing controllers And that's this design via Ragazzini. And the reason I like to start with Ragazzini is it makes you immediately start thinking about constraints. Constraints that you have to impose on your design or in your design process so that you come up with a valid controller. Ragazzini then immediately starts you thinking, I hope, in terms of constraints. If I give you the following system, let's say G1 of Z is now this 4Z over Z minus 1 half, Z minus 3 fourths, do we have to worry about any of the Ragazzini constraints to design a controller for this system? Is this system open loop stable? If the answer is yes, how did you determine that? You're looking at the poles, aren't you? And those poles are inside the unit circle. You know that then what we were calling restriction 3 or constraint 3 with respect to unstable poles, we don't have to worry about. Where are my zeros? It's at the origin. Is that an okay location? Restriction 2 doesn't imply, or we don't have to worry about. That one was dealing with unstable zeros. Restriction 4 was based on steady state behavior or steady state accuracy. Suppose we're not worried about that. All right, we had four restrictions. The first one was restriction 1. That was our causality constraint, wasn't it, or restriction. Our controller, you want to be causal meaning it can't be creating outputs based on future inputs. That imposes some property on the desired closed loop transfer function, capital T sub C of Z. What do we know about T sub C of Z for this particular system? Based on constraint one or restriction one. 
and it is dealing with the pole zero excess. Pole zero excess of at least how many fingers do we have? Five. Oh, 10, thank you for holding up your other hand. I was trying to minimize the number of choices in a multiple choice question. But if we had five possibilities, what's the pole zero excess in G sub one? One, so we need to at least be that big. Maybe I don't like that, let me. Of at least one. That was sort of a boring illustration of Ragazzini since we were only looking at one of the constraints. What if I gave you a different transfer function? Two times z minus two, z, z minus 1.5. Now what restrictions or constraints are in play? More than one. <laughs> That's a valid answer. Restriction one says that we need a pole zero excess of at least one. Restriction two, I'll just say that's dealing with zeros. That means that that unstable zero factor in the plant has to be retained in our desired closed loop transfer function. Z minus two is a zero factor. in T sub C of Z is restriction three in play. Restriction three dealt with unstable poles. We actually do have an unstable pole and if we do, we need to make sure that this expression, one minus T sub C of Z at the offending pole location, which in this case is 1.5, when we evaluate that, that better become zero, so that that is now allowing us not to cancel that unstable pole factor with an unstable zero factor in our designed controller. That's the purpose of satisfying this constraint. If we had a fourth constraint, That's this steady state accuracy, and here, maybe we would want the DC gain of our closed loop transfer function to be one. That was good because what did I really want to drive home with Ragazzini. Where are you going to lose the most points on your final if you do not observe this particular what design in your controller? What have I told you never, 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 never do? Pardon? Well, I think if you forget your name, by process of elimination, hopefully half of the class won't do that. And maybe I can deduce who didn't write their name on the exam. Um, 
Oh, you won't fail the class if you cancel an unstable poll if you don't put your name on. Well, you might. I wouldn't take that chance. Either way, I would put my name on my paper, I would show up for the final, and I wouldn't cancel unstable polls, and I wouldn't cancel unstable zeros. Does that mean you can't put poles and zeros outside the unit circle? Do we understand the difference? You can put poles and zeros outside the unit circle. You just can't do it to cancel poles and zeros. And that's one reason I like to start with Ragazzini. It sort of forces you into that mindset. We then moved on to PID controllers. This maybe one of the powerful parts of this is the vowel, not the consonant part of PID, but the vowel part, the I. What's important about, or what is a benefit of this integrator? It helps us with our steady state accuracy. Here is our And you know what that looks like in terms of a controller. If this was now C of Z, you now have some K, Z minus beta 1, Z minus beta 2, Z, Z minus 1. That's the generic structure of a PID controller. If I ask you to, to design a PID controller, you could just write that down. Now you are tasked with trying to find beta 1, beta 2. Where do I locate these zeros? They could be complex conjugates and the gain k. And depending on the problem, I may or may not have you compute k. Make sure you read the problem carefully because it takes you a little effort to find k. That's the magnitude condition. And you would have to find all of these links between K and all of your poles and zeros in your plant and controller in order to compute K because you need the magnitude condition to be true, which says that CG, the magnitude, if C includes the gain, is equal to 1. And if we're designing with PID controllers, a lot of times it's nice to understand the root locus. How do we construct that? And can you use that to inform how you are placing poles and zeros on your Z plane? If we talk about root locus construction, and I gave you the following transfer function. Suppose that I said, here's g of z. It's now z minus 1 fourth squared plus 1 fourth squared over z z plus one half squared plus one half squared. Even if you forgot your calculator, which don't do on the final, but if even if you did, is this system open loop stable? You have two one-halves there. Oh, they're squared. Your constant term in the denominator in that quadratic is one-half squared plus one-half squared. One-fourth plus one-fourth. It's now at a radius of one-half. But do you see where your poles and zeros are 
just based on that factored form of your plant? I'm hoping the answer is yes. And I want it to be yes today, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, at least by 3 p.m. or until 3 p.m. And ideally, if you're talking to somebody and they find out that you've taken a controls class at the University of Arizona, and they give you that plant, you could at least start to intelligently talk about that plant. And what would you start to say? You might say, oh, that plant has a pole zero excess of one. We have a pole at the origin. Where else do we have poles? So do we have poles at one half plus and minus J one half? No. Now that real part is now z equal to minus one half. So now we're over here. And if that's the case, where are the zeros located? They are now here, right? What's the root locus look like for this guy? Any ideas? is how big is your French bread? French bread's infinitely long, isn't it? It's the real axis, but how many times is it cut? It's only cut once, isn't it? We have two sections of the real line segment, two segments of our real line. Are any of those line segments, the positive or the negative half, apart or on the root locus. Is it clear that we have the left half real line belonging to the root locus? We looked at the angles to any of those points with a negative on the negative real line, they would have an angle of minus 180. The off-axis, you don't even have to worry about because they both cancel each other out in terms of their angles. So don't get confused by that. Now what? I picked this because it actually has sort of a, maybe a non-intuitive pattern. You could determine this several ways, but one thing you might want to be thinking about are angle of departure and angle of arrival. If you were told that the angle of arrival at those zeros was like minus 170 degrees, does that tell you anything? Now we're approaching this here, let's say. Hmm. And maybe I say the angle of departure of these from the poles is minus 135. I don't even know if that's true, but it's roughly. What if I told you this is what it looks like? Could you now put the arrows on that? I haven't yet shaded. If I really crank up the gain K, where are the arrows going to be? 
for large k, I'm approaching those zeros, aren't I? And I'm also moving off there. My pole zero excess is 1. I have one asymptote. It's at 180, and that's the one going off to minus infinity. My two poles, I have three poles. This pole is going here. This pole is going there. This one's going there. The two complex meet. One goes screaming off to the left. One goes screaming into the right. And it collides with that pole, the branch that's coming from the origin. And then they break off and go towards those zeros. How could you determine that that might have been the right pattern? What's another piece of information that you might have been able to use? What can you tell me about the behavior of the gain k on the real line, on the negative real line? What's happening when those poles come into the root real axis? What do we call that? That's a re-entry, and that occurs at what kind of, that's a relative minimum of k. What happens when they leave to approach those zeros? That's a relative max. That's a breakaway point. If you now sketched k on this for negative values of z, it would be having going experiencing a relative minimum, and then it would experience a relative maximum, and then it would go to zero at the origin at z equal to zero. Contrast that, let's say that you now are given a different system, and now maybe its pole zero diagram looks like the following. Maybe it is here, and then we have a pole there, and we have that. Now what's the root locus look like? We still have this piece, don't we? Ooh, that's supposed to be on the real line. Our pole zero excess is still 1. We have an asymptote of 180. It's zipping off to minus 180. Now you might say, well, tell me a little more. What's the angle of arrival? Maybe it's 180. What's the angle of departure from the poles? Maybe it goes hmm how would you check the validity of that root locus what's k doing on the negative real line is it experiencing a relative minimum is it experiencing a relative maximum That's a terrible line on the real line, but it's supposed to be straight. It's just monotonically increasing as you increase z to more negative values. k is getting bigger and bigger. It doesn't experience these dips and minimums and maximums. And that might inform your insight into sketching that particular root locus. But you can do that by he was a little late for his final. Questions on root locus construction. Let me quickly go through two more things. General z-plane controllers. By that I'm meaning maybe you have something that might be 
more like, let's say this is one, and maybe you have a pole out here and a zero there, and maybe you have a pole there, so that g of z looks something like that. Is that system open loop stable? If you had a pure gain controller, would you be able to stabilize that system in a unity output feed, negative unity output feedback configuration? No. You're stuck between one and a half, let's say, and two. How are you going to pull out your pole and zero shakers and potentially stabilize this system? What do you know not to do? You can't cancel either that pole at 1.5 or that zero at 2. He's still looking for his final. Oh, it locks. Thank you. I'll make sure he doesn't get locked down. But what are we going to, that gives us a little time to think about this design. What are we going to do? Thank you for trying. Hopefully he can finish his final in 10 minutes. How do, what are we going to do here? We want to somehow get that pole that's now zipping off to the zero at two to quit doing that immediately. We're wanting that pole at one and a half to move left instead of right initially. And we could maybe put a zero there. We could put it right on two if we wanted. Let's. Do, I'm just putting it somewhere so that we can see it. Can I just have a pure zero factor in my controller? No. I need it to be causal. I need the denominator to be at least the same order as the numerator. What if I just, for grins, put a pole there, which is actually right there. That's a negative minus 0.1. Now, speaking of cutting the bread, we have that segment, we have this segment, and we have this segment. Right? And what we hope is that this guy is going to approach that guy, and they won't break away beyond the unit circle. They will break interior to the unit circle so that maybe you can have closed-loop poles there before this guy goes zipping off to beyond minus 1. And if they do break away, they will... Do that. Is that clear? And on the final, if I would just sketch, I would just sketch, and if it doesn't work, just cross it out and sketch another one. Say, oh, that location for the zero didn't work. Try another one. Oh, that one didn't work. Try another one. You don't have to try too many, I don't think, before you'll hit on something that will work. But you need your controller, so you would have to then put a K there to adjust the gain to get you hopefully to those triangles. Questions on generic controller design? Sprinkling poles and zeros.
state space design. What do you need to do here? I want you to be able to apply full state feedback, which is this U of L is equal to minus K X of L. To be successful, what do you know property-wise your system has to exhibit for this K to allow you to place your poles wherever you want or your closed-loop eigenvalues wherever you want? What's the term or the system property that you're looking for? Controllability. You're assuming, well, you might want to check system controllability. Or you may just try to find K. If it's a second order, it may be pretty quick to just see if you can find K1 and K2. This is now a row vector to place closed loop poles at these desired locations. And if you can't, you might say, oh, my system may not be controllable, and then check controllability. Kind of doing it backwards, but you may be pressed for time. The other piece of the state space design that I want you to be able to do is deal with having a non-zero reference input meaning U of L not only has full state feedback, but you may also be introducing an external reference input. You're telling your system now you want to go somewhere instead of just settle from an initial condition with appropriate dynamics. Now you want to move somewhere with those same appropriate dynamics based on the choice of K. And you know a lot about appropriate dynamics based on heart, target, and angle. Questions? Fifteen problems covering some of this material that we've talked about today, and I hope this is starting to give you a more holistic picture of the semester. Yes? I probably won't be posting a practice final, meaning what you'll want to do then is look at the exams, look at the homeworks, then look at the notes, then if you're really having trouble falling asleep, watch the videos. Are there questions other than that one? Any other questions? Good luck with your finals. I'll see you Thursday at 1 in our original classroom.